Trans people and their very existence has become a focal point of British public debate over the last few years. They've become a football in the so-called culture wars, despite the fact that trans people are a very small and marginalised community whose well-being is severely harmed by the hostility directed towards them, often on a daily basis. The vast majority of that discussion, so-called, has firstly been with them excluded from it, and secondly, based almost entirely around negative framing, generally recycling many of the bigoted, horrible tropes long thrown at gay people, for example, being would-be sexual predators, threats to children, defies of the laws of biology, being defined by mental illness, being de deviants, forcing the so-called normal majority to bend uh, to our whims and so on. It's been particularly intense, this anti-trans moral panic in the United Kingdom, while in other European countries and several US states in particular, the direction of travel has been in the direction of affirming trans people. Now, within the context of the British Moral Panic, the so-called CAS review was commissioned in 2020 by NHS England. That is the Independent Review of Gender Identity Services for Children and Young People, led by retired consultant paediatrician Hilary Cass. Its findings include that there was no straightforward explanation for why there has been an increase in the number of young people with gender dysphoria. That is the distress a person feels because of a mismatch between their assigned gender identity and their own internal gender identity. It raises questions about the quality of research into trans medical healthcare, such as puberty blockers, which are also used for children who have premature puberty, that is cis children, those who are trans, as well as hormone therapy, with therefore uncertain conclusions one way or the other to be drawn, raising questions about physical health, but also potential evidence about hormone therapy, improving psychological help, um, advising caution, prescribing masculine, masculinizing or feminizing hormones, that while they should remain an option from the age of 16, there should, that should be with extreme caution and a clear clinical rationale given for not waiting until 18 was reached. Now, the review has been widely trumpeted by those often hostile from a number of directions to the very presence and acceptance of trans people in society. While many trans people have pointed to the arbitrary exclusion of studies which show the beneficial impact of gender-affirming healthcare, the fact that in reality trans people of all ages are stuck for years on waiting lists for gender-affirming healthcare, rather than there being any hastiness in offering that healthcare, the inclusion of tropes and narratives associated with those hostile to gender-affirming healthcare of any description, the fact that the detransition rate, that is those who decide to reverse their gender transition, is extremely low, less than 1%, much lower than other surgical interventions. And in many cases, that detransition is explained, for example, by the impact of transphobia. On that, I've personally interviewed myself, retransitioners, that is people who have detransitioned and then retransitioned uh, who have spoken to that point. A big concern raised is that the report also undermines uh, Gillett competence, legal competence uh, for younger people, suggesting proper adulthood isn't reached until the age of 25 because of brain development, which would have a devastating impact if taken to its logical conclusion on medical interventions for younger people in general. Um, also, many other criticisms, for example, claims made without evidence. But it's important you don't hear from me, but from the experts. In the second part, I'll speak to Freddie McConnell, who is a trans man a journalist who I've personally worked with at The Guardian, who I've learned a huge amount from. But first, let's speak to Dr. Aidan Kelly, Clinical Director at Gender Plus, a gender healthcare and education service in the UK and Ireland, who previously worked for several years at the NHS Gender Identity Development Service. I start by asking him for his overall thoughts on the review. Overall, it says some, you know, there are some sensible things, things there that I kind of would have expected and probably would have, I guess, as someone who's worked in the field for quite a long time, kind of known, I guess, I suppose. And um, so the idea of um, kind of better evidence base, holistic care, being able to meet all the needs of people that present to services and um, being cautious and careful with, with children. We're talking about medical interventions, all that stuff, you know, on the, on the surface kind of makes sense, I guess. Um, I guess the worry I guess I would hold is given the context of this, you know, the NHS situation in terms of funding and what can happen in terms of uh, healthcare provision, but also in terms of, I guess, more so the political climate around um, whether people even, some people even feel that trans people should have access to healthcare at all, which seems to be a kind of an, a legitimate discussion that we seem to be having at the moment and so I don't know how any of this is going to actually translate into making trans uh, people's lives any better really I suppose. 
Some of the critique from, particularly from trans people, has been, for example, on the fact that many peer-reviewed studies which are positive about the impact of affirming care, gender affirming care for trans people, were rejected, not in, not used in the study, partly because they weren't double blind studies, but you couldn't have done, I mean, just maybe might explain why those that's not possible. Um, but in practice, that distorts the results because a lot of those studies show affirming care works, gender affirming care works, but they're not included and that distorts the conclusions. Yeah, um, I guess in, in medicine, healthcare in general, especially in paediatric care, actually, there's very rarely um, areas of care where we do have those kind of double-blinded randomized control trials because it wouldn't be seen as ethical to kind of withhold treatment from a, um, a certain cohort, I suppose. And so most medications in paediatric care are used kind of off license or without that sort of evidence base. Um, and so I guess you could look to another approach, another way of doing it, which the Germans have just done. The German kind of, I think the German speaking countries so Germany, Austria and Switzerland have just kind of released their kind of version of the CAS report, basically only a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago now. And they kind of um, rejected the approach that NICE took in terms of setting the bar at that high and in that way. And they took what's called a consensus approach instead. So they kind of interviewed experts uh, who who would have many, many, many years, perhaps decades of experience of working this area, and I guess gathered a different sort of evidence in a different way, perhaps not to the same standard, but I guess a, a kind of a, a next best sort of situation. And so they went through a different approach because they recognized that if they went through the approach that NICE went, go, would, went through, you would end up with no good enough evidence. And so they took a different approach. And I guess they've come out, uh, I guess, in favor of the continuing use of puberty blockers and, and sex hormones for, for those at 16 and above. I'm somewhat alarmed by what the report seems to basically de facto raise adulthood to 25 based on science about how the brain matures and that therefore having an impact on the ability of younger trans people to consent to gender affirming healthcare. And just wonder what your thoughts are. Um, I mean, I think if that was to happen, the, you know, that would have to have implications for it couldn't just be for trans young trans people. There's lots of other big decisions that young people and have to make in terms of healthcare. And um, I guess the on the face of it, again, the kind of idea of having a an uninterrupted um, kind of transition or, or kind of uh, pathway of care for those turning 18, 19, 20 into young adulthood sounds like a kind of a good, sensible thing. The idea that you just drop off at 18 and become an adult. And so I guess the idea that there's a kind of a, a soft landing into into adult services in principle sounds good and um, it will require more resource more funding i guess it, it kind of the the things that we're, la we're left with i don't really know what the detail of all of this will be and will that does is what's been said actually meaning that we um restrict access to hormones for those older so they shouldn't quite say that but i guess it, it's 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 there's, there's an amount left for interpretation i suppose i guess i can understand with people's skepticism about how trans healthcare has gone in this country for so long now and so i understand why people are quite skeptical and and perhaps imagine the worst when they read something and so um i don't know if that's what's intended i'm not part of those discussions but i, I fully understand those worries and um, one of the other frustrations a lot of trans people have is the reality of being trans is that you're stuck on waiting lists for many years to get gender affirming healthcare, whilst a popular perception often spread by those perhaps hostile to the very existence of, of well, trans people, certainly the trans rights movement, as well as a lot of the media. The perception pushed is basically a young person says they're trans and then they basically puberty blockers are just forced down their nose or something. I mean, but that's not the reality. So what is the reality based on your own clinical experience? Yeah. Um, so the reality is, um, and, and Dr. Cass did I mean, didn't labour the point, but did reference this in the in the report that um, prior to her um, kind of review in in committee being commissioned in September 2020, she looked at the data from JIDS in terms of the the previous adolescent service that closed, the NHS adolescent service that closed last month, and compared it against its kind of international peers of doing doing similar work. and And JIDS actually came out as the the more conservative. 
um, service, I suppose, compared to international peers. And when I would go to these international conferences when I was at Jude's, and um, we were always got positioned in terms of conferences as the ones who were more careful, took our time more, maybe even waited, delayed too long, actually. But um, so internationally, JIDS had the reputation of being quite conservative. So to put some numbers to that, about our post-assessment, um, about 25% of those who would finish an assessment would ever get referred for for hormonal treatment, whereas our international colleagues were, were referring at a much higher rate. And I'm not saying one was right or wrong, but I guess in terms of approach to that, um, but I guess nationally, the kind of the discourse is very much being around um, young people, you know, declaring their trans in the playground and then being given puberty blockers after, you know, at the end of the school, you know, bell or something, you know, the idea that we are it was the conveyor belt of people going on to medication, which is not borne out by the data. Um, and, and I guess in, in a way, it, it's kind of concerning to me that that kind of narrative continues, even though the, the data doesn't really um, kind of stand up to that, really. I mean, I mean, linked to that, that, you know, some of those responding to this uh, review say, well, this was just a medic. This was a, a scandalous medical experiment on children. Um, and this scandal will unravel in the coming years as lots of young people who weren't in a position to consent will say, look what you've done, who, who, you know, th this is what I wanted in the end. But I've, this is had you know i won't be able to reverse the the impact and all the people who cheer this on will be damned by history um but detransition rates amongst trans people is very low isn't it and and if you compare it to people who have for example various forms of surgery or indeed abortion um the level of you know abortion regret the evidence just isn't there is it detransition exists but it's very low yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously we want to look after um, all people that get referred to gender clinics, those for whom this the medical pathway is the appropriate and right one, but also those for whom it might not kind of meet the needs that they kind of present with. But I guess we can't overly focus on one set over the over the needs of the other. And I guess my worry is that sometimes, although we need to be careful and we need to look after people who may later detransition or regret going down this pathway, we can't do that at the expense of the, the the majority of the people for whom from my clinical experience can benefit greatly it's never medical transition is never the whole answer you know the psychological factor the social factors feeling accepted and embraced in society and having all those other pieces in 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 in, in in, um, kind of in place are, are absolutely also very very important medical transition can complement that but to deny that um, for fear of getting it wrong. And I think that's kind of what feels like what's happening yeah. in, uh, in in England in particular at the moment. There's a kind of, we're caught fear in a way, and we're kind of very much afraid of, of getting something wrong. When I guess the people who, and the, with the expertise and who've been doing this work for so long, I guess perhaps don't hold that fear as greatly as some people on the outside seem to. Because I mean, just I mean, because it's interesting. Because detransition is less than one percent, isn't it, in terms of longitudinal studies? In, in just your clinical experience, or just a couple of other things. Just in terms of your clinical experience, what proportion of people who end up referred to a gender clinic end up going through, for example, a medical cap pathway? I guess that uh, the proportion increases as you get older. And so, I guess if a, if a a fourteen year old comes to see me versus say a twenty four year old, I guess you're. Uh, a 24 year old you can be more confident in terms of them knowing their mind and kind of having life experience and so i say an adult kind of in their kind of early to mid-20s the majority of those who come through would um access medical treatment i think younger ones um they might access it in a, at a later point but i guess you want to be i think understandably more cautious um, um with with younger people so i think that jids data that we talked about would kind of be somewhere between the 25 to 50 percent the kind of the lower the lower side and um, it's not to say that they might not later access it but i guess you don't want to intervene too early you want to kind of keep options open and then when they get a little bit older you can feel a bit more confident in in doing those sorts of things and so um you know my goal is never around pushing someone away or towards medication it's trying to think you know am i looking after the 14 year old now but also the 20 the future of them as well because i guess there's issues like fertility and different things to think of and um, that you know holding the option open for a while can be helpful but also you don't want to at the same time you don't want to kind of um put them through undue distress and maybe 
kind of damage their other areas of their kind of life and functioning. Some young people struggle to even go to school because of these things. So you kind of, it's 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 not a nice, easy position to be in kind of going, oh, let's just do this or do that. No one arrives at these decisions easy. There's lots of um, kind of hard discussions, lots of really tough thinking that goes on with the family, probably even before they get to see you. And then you're doing it all over again with them over a period of time. And so no one comes to this decision lightly, especially at a, at a younger age, really. I mean, one of the things that just as a as a gay man and a, obviously a former gay child, uh, I, I read just you worry about these sorts of tropes which have been, to be frank, circulating amongst those who are hostile to healthcare and gender affirming healthcare and so on. Um, a perception, for example, there's less validation for gay students in schools than for trans people. So basically, this idea that. Um, there's less stigma attached to being trans than being gay, and these claims that people who are homophobic try to trans their kids. It, it's just you read that it's just so unbelievably disconnected from the reality of of LGBTQ people. It's just one of the maddest things I've ever read. Like no gay person, I really don't think, would ever really claim that it's harder to be gay than to be trans. I just I can't even get my head around it as a concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it kind of goes back to some of those ideas around, you know, when 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 the, when when it was kind of the debate around whether it was okay to be gay or not, or around like the idea that this was a choice, or people could kind of somehow um, choose to be that way or not choose, and actually, if they just did X, Y, and Z, then maybe things could be different. Or, and then the ideas around conversion therapy, and that it sadly is kind of reared its head again, you know, in, in, in this country again in the last few years around whether something could make someone, if we do one thing, you know, let them socially transition, that's going to make them confirm their transness or or, or these sorts of things. And it, my, my experience is that one of, first of all, it's, it's unethical to try to push someone away or towards a, a certain identity and adolescence should be a time of experimentation and exploring. You don't know, we want to kind of allow people work that, um, that out for themselves in their own time, but also, if you want to be really brutal about it, there's no evidence base to support that you could even do it, even if you really wanted to. Yeah. But not only is it unethical and harmful, there's if we're talking about evidence base, there's no evidence base that actually letting so people social transition it makes them more likely to be trans, or actually um, that by not allowing them to do that, it's going to push it away as well. So, I mean, we, if we really want to talk about evidence, we need to talk about what we're doing now, and there's no evidence for the approach that we're taking now but that you know so we need we need to we need to really be uh, interrogate this from both angles i suppose and just finally then on this in terms of where this goes next um i mean in terms of for for younger trans people what this means i mean one of the things i've read which again sorry one of the points of the report about uh, if a child tries to socially transition then there should be basically medical involvement i don't even know how it works because if young people come out as trans so they say that and then they i mean i don't even know how that would work. they say that you know that basically means dressing in a certain way asking for pronouns uh changing their name um in terms of how they're spoken to i i don't even know how you would do that or enforce that um, and, and yeah. yeah go on no i guess that's part of what i'm getting at the, at the implementation of this you know it would be great if you said actually i'm I'm, I'm, I think I might be trans or I am trans and it would be wonderful if we could access kind of knowledgeable expert professional help, you know, the next day and talk it through and think about it in a kind of a respectful kind of affirming way. However, I know that's not going to be happening. And um, and so by putting something like that in play or stipulating that, well, you know, not, that's just totally unworkable. And I think, I don't know if, it was, if I'm quite right in remembering this way, but I think it was during that very short Liz Truss kind of uh, period of, 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 of premiership that there was an injection into one of the interim review there. There was something around um, social transition there that it felt very much like um, politics and healthcare where kind of the, the lines were, were blurring a little bit. And, and so I guess I would, I, I don't know how we would even police that who's going to say to what if i a little kid cuts the hair short are we going to say what's going on here and, and then it becomes actually we're, we're kind of um gender policing or you know it becomes a bit a bit a bit crazy to think of actually how that would all work so it gave me some little trust and nostalgia there just finally um in terms of uh oh god i miss her um just in terms of where you think this all ends partly because there's a review suggested in terms of adult uh, gender affirming services and i would just just say because at the moment a lot of people who i would say trans hostile are jubilant they think they've won this is a great victory for them um i think they're going to be frustrated when they realize trans people are still going to exist 
and they will increase in number just because the number of lesbian, gay, and bisexual people has increased in number because it's it's become you know amongst younger generations what was once socially unacceptable has become acceptable and there's nothing really you can do about it so they're probably i think a lot of people think they've won this victory and then as time goes on they'll see more and more trans people and they'll be i think a bit perturbed by that yeah 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 i think and um, i think one interesting thing as well to kind of kind of talk about is that the the kind of proportion of um, neurodiverse people is also increasing, so more and more people are getting diagnosed with kind of Hi. autism and ADHD. But also, ADHD, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and so, um, but also, uh, queer identities, LGBT, LGBT identities are more prevalent within the neurodiverse community as well. There's something that goes hand in hand, and trans is, is, trans identities are, are, are no different in terms of that respect. Yeah. And so, I think you're right. I think um, there's, there is going to be increased increased prevalence. Um, what these people are going to do or how this is going to react, I don't know. I think, um, sadly, in a way, this report doesn't really change very much because the NHS service has already been pretty much inaccessible for the last four years. It's now a five plus year waiting list. I think I've talked about this in, in other places before. But, the you know, when the, the, the report or the review started in 2020, there was like about two year wait list. Um, but you had a staff team of about 80 clinicians in JIDS and you had four bases. That whole team has been shut down. All of those staff have left. You've now got two bases with um, a total of 18 clinicians spread out across those two. None of those 18 clinicians have ever worked in gender before. And you've got a wait list of five years. So when you've got people who are waiting even longer, the holistic needs, those other needs, are even going to be more complex, more embedded, and you're going to have a staff team or less equipped to deal with that and so sadly um i don't see i don't hold out a huge amount of hope that there's going to be a quick resolution and sadly i, I would do always try to suggest to people who might be considering coming out or or, or have come out and connecting into local kind of lgbt friendly and trans friendly kind of support groups and spaces are a really really good first place to start um and then there's kind of you can kind of link into local supports that way counselors or other ways of trying to find support there are i mean there's a our group which we are kind of a group of people of, of former clinicians who i guess would love to still be in the nhs we've worked in the nhs for a long time i guess we've been frustrated by the fact that we didn't couldn't use our skills and expertise in the way that we want to we were meeting people you know after it was after the fact after so long and so i guess we are one there's one on independent service on the age of 18 that exists but we'd, we'd welcome more we would love to be doing more we'd love to kind of have funded pathways in to see us and um, and so you know i think there's the small acts of resistance that are are kind of happening out there to try and bring the sorts of care that's needed to the people that need it really now I speak to the brilliant Freddie McConnell and ask about the sense of vindication and triumphalism amongst those who are trans hostile. I, I don't know where they're finding that. I don't think, I mean, they'll they'll just do that no matter what, right? I, I, I've been, yeah, sort of uh, immersed in this subject for so long. I've seen this happen before where no matter what someone says, the people who want to deny that trans people exist will read that into it. They will find the vindication um because that's what they're looking for like I, I i actually don't think the report does that i think on the face of it um the people you know i guess just as you and i know a lot about um the problems facing the trans community the people that are obsessed with taking away our rights and denying our existence know a hell of a lot about their sort of special interest so they are seeing things that aren't there i genuinely think it's a kind of hallucination um I do at the, at the same time. Um, I don't think Cass has gone anywhere near far enough in in correcting them and saying actually no, this isn't about what you think it is. You know, people have written columns for the Daily Mail saying it didn't go far enough. You know, so they're not. It's not. I think that the headline obviously is that's just the right wing press, right? That it's opportunistic. They will they will literally make things up um, to fit what they want to say to fit their narrative. Um, but at the same time, if you read a bit closer, it, it says things like it hasn't gone far enough. You know, now we need to sort of say that trans children don't exist, this sort of thing. And, and, the, and the report doesn't do that. And um, and I don't know, you know, I think it should have done, it should have been more explicit the other way is it because of the times we're living in, you know, you need that explicit assertion that, mm -hmm. oh, no, we're not, we're not buying into this um, trans hostile narrative. And, 
So one of the arguments made, for example, Ros Cavani, who is a writer, poet, a veteran, trans activist, been involved in the trans rights movement now for many decades. Um, and her critique focuses on how the Casa Review rejects an abundance of peer-reviewed studies which are positive about affirming care for trans people, regardless of age, and including young trans people. Uh, so these studies show that they're they have an they're effective they do what they're supposed to do which is obviously those with gender dysphoria those who are young trans people they get this gender affirming healthcare and it, and it, and it has a has a positive impact um now they've been excluded on the basis they're not double blind studies but the argument there is you can't do double blind studies so just explain why you can't do why it is an ethical you can't do that and um, but but why it matters that those studies have been excluded because many would argue that completely distorts the research and the outcome by definition yeah absolutely and i, I made reference to that in my piece that there's lots of stuff that she chose to exclude um and i don't think there's anything the, the, the studies that are proposed um, are obviously have huge ethical and methodological issues as well, be it the uh, where children are, or young, young people who want to go on blockers have to, uh, they're forced to sort of enroll in a study, otherwise they can't access that. Uh, and also the idea that um, the gender identity clinics for adults should release information about 9,000 people that have been through. Um, I've seen at first hand, I, I've I know like what data handling is like um, mm -hmm. when it comes to trans patients on the NHS. I've heard of like horrific data breaches um, that are just like normal, I, I guess, um, in some places. Um, so I'm not surprised that the GICs don't want to just hand over that data. I, mean, I don't mm -hmm. think they particularly look after the data very well in the first place, but yeah, that seems unethical to not be able to, you know, get the people's consent for their data being handed over. Those things aren't, the kinds of studies that we need, but I do think we do need studies. I think trans healthcare in general is very understudied, underfunded, mm -hmm. as is healthcare of lots of, in lots of different areas for minority groups. So that I think is, that's kind of what I was referring to as like, that's just a common sense thing to say, like obviously we need more information, more research, more money, more funding for, for this area of healthcare. Do it you would not be ethical. The findings though, because they've because these studies people, I mean, if you support, gender affirming healthcare for trans people, mm. then you would cite these studies, but these studies aren't, they're not, they're excluded from the report. Do I worry that it distorts the findings of the, yeah. oh yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. That's one of the biggest ways in which you see this anti-trans bias in the, in the report. Yeah. I think, I mean, yeah, like I said, I, I to me, it just seems like lots of sort of platitudes, like, you know, the recommendations, more services, more holistic, safer. I, what does, yeah, what does that mean? It sounds like common sense. It sounds great it, on the face of it and in plain reading. Sure. Like a lot of that is what the trans community has been asking for, for years. Um, you know, shorter waiting lists, all this sort of stuff. I just think there's, yeah, that there's been, um, I don't know enough about it to be quite honest with you to, uh, to be able to say this is precisely why she excluded this and that and I don't think she should have excluded this and that yeah it's kind of and that to me just seems like a, a no-brainer and I think just to go on to the point of like um, why it would be unethical to do a double blind study on children I mean again I'm not a researcher but my understanding is that you can't double blind something that involves children and young people especially not where they're being given something that produces obvious physical changes but yeah. again, like this is an area of healthcare and, and study where um trans people are being unfairly targeted and penalized for this being a difficult thing to study because if you look at for example the thing that comes to mind for me is like morning sickness when you're pregnant right like, i've been pregnant twice um you can't study people who are pregnant so you can't say for sure that morning sickness medication is safe but mm. everyone knows that it is because it's been mm. used safely for years. Um, mm. So that is a way in which it would be considered, you know, it's more ethical to give the medication, which is uh, believed to be safe, than it would be to withhold it just because you can't do a double blind study. So um, no one sort of questions that for pregnant people and pregnant women. But obviously in this way, it, for trans people, it's being used as a kind of a stick to beat us, um, which is 
obviously incredibly unfair and a double standard. I mean, well, a lot of people out there, let's be honest, I'll just forget the review for a second, but their view basically is uh, a young person says they're trans and then basically they're getting puberty block blockers just pumped down the throat like that. Um, when actually the truth about any form of gender affirming healthcare is that people are stuck on waiting lists for a very long time. Mm. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, the point you made, you, you write in your article for The Guardian um, about um, about PBT Bockers, about, for example, in, it was in 2022, there were 378 children and young people eligible to be prescribed, a very small proportion of people. So it's just that that's not the reality versus the perception. No, and this is something that at this point it's hard to know what to do with this issue when it keeps coming up. And obviously, again, this is a, example where she doesn't take the opportunity to make these points of how few children were being prescribed how it it was it wasn't rushed I, you know there are huge gaps um to put it generously in the report around this kind of thing and also i mean i think yeah it's hard to know what to say about the future because you know we we know this we, we know how how hard it actually was to get them, how rare it was for children to be prescribed them, um, how much sort of counselling and therapy and waiting they had to go through. Again, people I've spoken to personally, um, who I know personally, who I've interviewed, I, I never heard anything else. Um, mm -hmm. I think there was, sometimes you would um, hear of GPs doing a bridging prescription of um, cross set of like testosterone or estrogen for a much older, like 16, 17, 18 year old. So when that was, my understanding is that when that happens, it's much more likely to come from a, a GP than it is from GIDS. But even then, it's very rare. Um, yeah, I mean, my experience of the adult services was is, is similarly that it was incredibly cautious. And so all we can do is keep saying that and knowing that there are some clinicians working in this field who also know that, obviously, including, you know, endocrinologists and who you know i think will hopefully be there will stay there and you know won't abandon their right. specialism i would fully understand why they felt they needed to but yeah it's kind of um i think the most egregious thing actually that i saw in the whole report was putting that recommendation in the in the kind of top summary this idea of like um using extreme caution i think it was extreme caution when prescribing um masculinizing or feminizing hormones to under 18s like that is an incredibly misleading statement to put anywhere let alone in the, on the front page it's sort of like i said you know chances are if that if that ever was to happen it would be a 16 17 18 year old because by that point puberty blockers are completely pointless yeah um by the way <laughs> um so but yeah she is sort of foregrounding it and that's what i think the whether it's I just think she's, I don't know what's going on in her head. And I'm, I suppose a part of me is wanting what she's saying to be true in terms of like, when you actually hear her interviewed about this stuff, she doesn't say the super extreme stuff that you hear people like David Bell coming out with, yeah. um, or like journalists, obviously, who are on the kind of um, turfy side of things. But, um, and you know, you hear compassion in her voice talking about trans people, including trans, trans children. Um, so it's funny because in a way i feel like you know all we hear about is how trans people are silencing the critics and you know um right-wing journalists are very very keen to talk about how tavistock clinicians were silenced and pressured into not speaking up to raise their concerns and stuff and actually what i kind of feel might or well, suspect or worry could have happened um like <laughs> To me, it seems like Cass is the one that's being silenced. It seems like she's the one that's under pressure. Like, if she really believes these things about trans children needing holistic, safe, effective, timely care, why isn't she coming out more strongly against um, the absolute extreme bigots who would mm. rather take all of our healthcare away? I wish I could sort of ask her in person are you feeling are you feeling pressured to are you feeling silenced are you, you know what are you afraid of here because that's that's the what, vibe i'm getting one of the claims made 
um, centers on the question of young people making life changing decisions before they're in a position to be able to understand what they're doing. But I mean, the, the point about detransition rates is it's extremely low, isn't it, amongst mm. um, those who who come out as trans and then have gender affirming healthcare. I mean, the, the number of the detransition rate amongst trans people is 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 in long in into into lo, in sorry in longitudinal studies it's less than one percent. Mm. And actually, a lot of that is complicated. It's, for example, to do with transphobia. I've interviewed a retransitioner who made that point. Mm. They detransitioned because of transphobia and lack of support. Yeah. Um, whereas if you look at knee and hip surgery, or indeed people who regret having abortions, it's much higher. Like So mm. what you, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the, the 1% figure is is around um, sort of regret, certainly, when it comes to gender-affirming surgeries. I think the detransition rate might be slightly higher but again that is including all people who detransition including people who do it for financial or social reasons you know that the not the percentage of people who detransition it's like a tiny percentage of a tiny percentage right the, the people who detransition because they no longer identify as trans um yeah i mean it's we all know this <laughs> it's mm. not hard to find it, it takes a quick google i think I guess I take issue with the idea of puberty blockers being, you know, um, life change. Well, I suppose they're life changing in the sense that they are helpful and that they, you know, they do. It's just I, all the all the things that are actually true about puberty blockers have been so kind of undermined by the narrative in our media. I, I almost don't want to repeat them, like yeah, because course, yeah. it's sort yeah. of, um, but yeah, because if you look at again, if you sort of Google, if you look at it from an American perspective or an Australian or Canadian. Um, you, you can very quickly find online like very kind of sensible, sober advice about puberty blockers, how they use for different reasons and the re you know, and they're called experimental, but that's actually they're just it's an off label use for trans children. That's very common in pediatric medicine to have off label uses of medication because again, it's not ethical to study children. And it's I don't want to kind of give any seriousness or credence or time to the to these yeah. talking points, like which is yeah. a criticism yeah. of you. It's just no, no, like, no, no, it's just making that point about detransition yeah, is, yeah. is is very low. It's, it's worth good flagging that because what yeah. we keep hearing people yeah. in the aftermath of this, well, all of you people, you're going to have to end up begging for forgiveness for all these people now who have had this gender affirming healthcare and they're going to regret it. And then there's going to be this big scandal yeah. and you're the people who egged it all on when detransition rates are obviously very low. We need to bear in mind who is saying this stuff. Like, I've heard I've heard it. People say you know that this will be the trans medicine will be the biggest scandal since thalidomide, which is like incredibly insulting, as well as just being like wildly inaccurate. So like, if Cass was saying that kind of thing, that mm -hmm. would be one thing. But the fact that these the people who are so the people who are saying this have been saying this for like decades in some cases. So like, yes, yeah, we, we can't ignore they? them yeah. because they're dangerous. Well, exactly. Yeah. But because there are I'm, there just, are people who high profile do, and it's not to take away the validity of people who do transition it's just the plural of you know anecdote isn't statistics you you, you always you'll all that yeah. inevitable whereas absolutely the, 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 that is an except they're real it's not to say that, yeah. that those people who don't exist kira bell exists but they're not the norm and well sorry they're very it's a very rare occurrence and also detransition it's, rare. it's also complicated yeah, and, she, and she was like arguably um you know the poster child it wasn't she wasn't just an individual taking the tavistock to court she was she had a whole team of people behind her your, your final thoughts i want is just because now what's proposed is a review of adult services you are an adult mm. trans person what's your thoughts finally on 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 that proposal and the general climate right now <laughs> well when i say that i often think i need to like sort of find the courage to leave this country that's not i'm not exaggerating <laughs> so that's kind of where i am i guess and um i don't want to be one of those people that sort of yeah just says that and never you know because it's kind of a it's an easy thing to say and i guess it's fine to say actually because it's kind of a way of soothing and calming yourself down and the idea that you could potentially do that obviously doing that would mean being in a very privileged position um but when i think about it and sometimes talk about it to me it feels like a very serious option that i need to be considering um depending on where all this stuff goes not necessarily it wouldn't have to get to the point of my healthcare or my hormones being taken away but it could just be 
it's going to get to the point where it just feels impossible to live in this country because of the politics and the culture and mm -hmm. the stress. Like, I, it's hard to do my job. I've not written about this sort of stuff for years, ever since I had kids, really. And my eldest is now six. And it, so, I, and it, you know, in a way, it's because I haven't done it for six years. I've been off Twitter for six years that I finally feel able, you know, and also just like financially, you know, need to like make my work, job work as a journalist um, to come back and then sort of dip my toe in again. And it's super stressful and draining. And if I'm not on Twitter, you know, it's hard to keep up with the conversation, you know, so yeah, it's, I, I hate it. I hate it here. <laughs> um, and I don't want my the piece I wrote for the Guardian, even though it's quite a kind of, the tone is quite sort of calm and, um, and I'm sure some people will feel that it's much too soft on Cass and um, that wasn't my intention. I, you know, I guess that's just how I'm dealing with this moment. Mm -hmm. like people deal mm -hmm. with it in different ways and that's, that's what came out. And, but the main thing I want is a, it's a genuine call on her to clarify her position and clarify that she understands that people like David Bell and everyone that he's around him and the organizations he's a part of, um, you know, clearly don't believe that trans people are real and that we should yeah. have access to healthcare that's equal as anyone else's access to their healthcare. So, um, yeah, I hope she, she gets back to me on that one, but yeah, I mean, the idea of, I don't, it's, I'm almost avoiding talking about the idea of a review of adult services cause it's just, it's just too much. <laughs> Thanks so much for these brilliant and deeply informative contributions. I learned a lot. I hope you did as well. As a journalist committed to giving a platform as best I can to those who are marginalised and demonised, as well as an LGBTQ person loyal to my broader community, I'll keep as best I can offering a platform to trans people and their allies in this deeply hostile environment. I would note how Britain is becoming an outlier compared to many other European nations. I don't think personally that will hold, but as was the case with gay and lesbian and bisexual people, here in the past, and as it remains the case in much of the world, it will continue to be a rocky and difficult ride. Easy for me to say, but I hope the continued ally allyship of all too few people in the public domain, but there are those of us who exist who will continue to be allies no matter what. Um, I hope we can do something at least to stand by you. Please like and subscribe. Uh, do leave your comments. Um, I don't normally say this, but it's a sensitive subject. Do keep them sensitive, if that is possible. Uh, do share the video, get the message out. Uh, you can keep the show on the road on patreon.com forward slash or listen to us the podcast. I'll speak to you soon.